I know he would say, I know that sounds strange, but it's because it's so important to us. But guess what? They ended up getting divorced. So, well, scheduling sex is not a bad idea. And if I were forced to have sex with Tony Robbins, I'd have to schedule it too. But uh, scheduling sex is different from treating it like a chore. Scheduling sex, I mean, we schedule everything else that's important in our lives. Nobody just spontaneously goes bowling. Nobody just spontaneously does anything anymore. We all, and that has nothing to do with COVID, uh, we all lead very scheduled lives. So, you know, if, if you want to go for a hike this weekend uh, and you're in a couple, you probably are going to say to your mate, uh, gee, it would be nice to go for a, a hike this weekend. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today our guest is Dr. Marty Klein. He is a sex therapist and a licensed marriage and family therapist and the author of seven books. How are you today, Marty? Nice to see you again, Rich. It's nice to see you as well. So Marty, we're going to talk, folks, we're going to talk about something you may or may not have heard of, sexual intelligence. And my hope is that we're going to talk about it in regards to intimacy, because it seems like intimacy is something that's not always understood, particularly in the sexual context. But first, I'm curious. We've got like in IQ, intellectual intelligence. We've got emotional intelligence. What is sexual intelligence? Well, sexual intelligence, loosely defined, is uh, the combination of body awareness and emotional skills and um, information that people need in order to create sexual satisfaction. So it's three things, body awareness, emotional skills, and information. And everybody, no matter what your orientation or identity, gender, whatever, everybody needs a bunch of each of those three things in order to create sexually satisfying experiences. And I'm, I'm curious because I've, I've given this a lot of thought personally and works with a lot of people who have this going on. How does that show up sort of in the distinction between the basic physical act of sex, like where there's just chemistry, and then uh, I've had another sex therapist who said it isn't really sex unless there's emotion uh, uh, involved. How does how does well, it, that's silly. How, how well, just one one woman's opinion is what it was. So uh, how, how how does this show up in that context? Well, if if you ask people what do they want from sex, if you ask people. When you if, you, if you get to have sex this Saturday night, what kind of an experience would you like to have? What do you want from that experience? Most people don't say, oh, I want 27 orgasms and I want, you know, big orgies and hang from the chandeliers and, you know, screaming and all that. What most people want is some combination of pleasure and closeness. Mm. Some people want more of one, some people want more of the other. And for each of us, the balance of those two things is different from one experience to the next. Mm -hmm. so, so what that means is that you would think, if people were logical, that when people construct their sexual experiences, when people decide who to have sex with, when people decide what activities to do, when people decide, is this a good time to do it or not? If people were completely logical, which we know they're not, people would be thinking about, okay, how do I create pleasure and closeness in an experience? But as it happens, most people are focused on completely other things besides pleasure and closeness when they're being sexual, when they're even putting together a sexual experience. So what are people focused on uh, during sex, before sex? How do I look? How do I smell? How do I taste? I hope I get an erection. I hope I don't come too fast. I hope I lubricate. I hope my partner is not disappointment with the shape of my body. All that stuff that people focus on, not only does it not contribute to pleasure, not only does it not contribute to, to feeling close, it takes people away from the experience. You might as well be thinking about the Los Angeles Dodgers as thinking about your erection if you want to create pleasure or closeness. That's funny. There's a, there, back in the day, there used to be a saying that if you wanted to slow down your orgasm for the woman, that you'd think about baseball. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it's funny that you would say, you might as well think about the Dodgers. So question, if what you want is to have, actually, I'm going to roll it back. I mean, because I think all those things that you talked about, they really have application depending on where you are in the relationship. I mean, if two people are having are being intimate for the first time, if they're having sex for the first time, there's probably a lot more of that up front. If you've been married for 20, 30, 40 years, you're probably a little less worried about your breath and all that other good stuff. Not true, not true, not true. Really? Tell, them, tell me more. Well, if... If you get a hundred people together, all of whom fake orgasm, let's just take one little metric. Find a hundred people who fake orgasm. It's not hard to do. Find a hundred men or women who fake orgasm. Some percentage of them are single. A lot of them are in a couple, married. Mm -hmm. Those people are in a couple for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, I hope I don't wet the bed. Not just for single people, married people too. I hope I don't fart during sex. Not just single people, people who are married for a long time also. Gee, I don't want him to go down on me because I don't think I smell really fresh down there. Not only single people for the first time, lots of long-term married couples. So people are concerned about um, about all these peripheral things. I, I hope I get an erection, you know. Uh, lots of people who've been married for 25 years are so worried about that mm-hmm. they can't enjoy the sexual experience. So it's not only first timers. Got it. And how does sexual intelligence, how do we apply sexual te- intelligence to these c- scenarios that you're describing? Well, let's say that you just bought the Los Angeles Dodgers, since we're talking about the Dodgers not to be confused with the Brooklyn Dodgers, which is where they belong. So let's say we- That's that's another show. That's another show. (laughs) Let's say you bought the Dodgers and you wanted to make the Dodgers a championship team. Uh And And you thought about it and you thought of it and you said, you know what we need is new uniforms. Yeah. What? Yes, yes, yes. We need new uniforms and we need a new team mascot. And we need a new team song. People would think you're crazy. People would say that is not the way you build a championship baseball team. However, however, when it comes to sex, people who want to create good sexual experiences, they are frequently focused on the wrong things. So where sexual intelligence comes in, sexual intelligence, the concept, it says, okay, so what do you really need to create good sex? Is it an erection? Not necessarily. Is it lots of vaginal lubrication? Not necessarily. Is it uh, having an orgasm every single time? Not necessarily. Is it ignoring the sexual side effects of whatever prescription medication you're taking? Definitely not. So when I talk about sexual intelligence, I say to people, okay, Let's talk about what you really want from sex and let's talk about what are the actual ingredients of that. Is it necessarily intercourse? Is it necessarily an orgasm? Is it necessarily not wetting the bed? So that's where sexual intelligence comes in. All right. So the first step is to think about what you want to get from sex. Right. Right. Which a lot of people don't do. Which a lot of people don't do. A lot of people are thinking either... I ought to do it because my partner wants it, or I should want to do it because I'm in love, or I want to do it because uh, I don't want uh, this other person to think I'm a prude or that I'm not a real man. So right from the beginning, right from the beginning, people well, are handicapping themselves if they're not thinking about I what- that I read an article that says that, that healthy relationships have regular sex, and you know I haven't put it in my calendar yet, so I better get on that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's really unfortunate. Um, if, you treat, if you treat sex like just one more chore, it's going to feel like one more chore. You know, Tony Robbins used to have this thing he said. He would say, I value my marriage so much that my wife and I schedule our sex time. Now, I know he would say, I know that sounds strange, but it's because it's so important to us. But guess what? They ended up getting divorced. <laughs> so, well, scheduling sex is not a bad idea. And if I were forced to have sex with Tony Robbins, I'd have to schedule it too. But uh, 
scheduling sex is different from treating it like a chore. Scheduling sex, I mean, we schedule everything else that's important in our lives. Nobody just spontaneously goes bowling. Nobody just spontaneously does anything anymore. We all, and that has nothing to do with COVID, uh, we all lead very scheduled lives. So, you know, if, if you want to go for a hike this weekend uh, and you're in a couple, you probably are going to say to your mate, uh, gee, it would be nice to go for a, a hike this weekend. And your partner might say, well, you know, I'm getting my nails done Saturday morning, so that's out. And you might say, well, you know, I want to watch, uh, I want to watch an NFL game on Sunday afternoon, so that's out. So you say, well, do we want to go for a hike Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning? Uh, how about Saturday afternoon? Great idea. And, and that's scheduling. That is scheduling. We don't agree we're going to do it at exactly 135, but that's scheduling. That's sort of getting a, um, a sense of the depends rhythm. Of who you are. Maybe you're going to calendar it. You're going to be right on time. It really depends. It depends on your personality. But yes, I as feel long like as it doesn't feel like a chore. Right. Got it. Got it. And so if we want to take sexual intelligence and apply it to building intimacy through sex, how would we do that? Well, a lot of people think that the main predictors of sexual satisfaction are genital function. You know, how great is your erection? How quickly do you lubricate? Do you orgasm easily and frequently? But that's actually, those are not good predictors of sexual satisfaction. The two main predictors of sexual satisfaction are self-acceptance and communication. Mm -hmm. Where sexual intelligence uh, you know, as a factor in intimacy is people accepting their bodies exactly the way they are today, even if you aspire to have a different body next year, accepting our bodies the way that they are, and then communicating with our partner. Let me tell you a little bit more about my body, and let me tell you a little bit more about what I want in sex. Let me tell you the one or two things that you do that, you know, I just assume you not do it. You know, like when you have an orgasm and you do that fingernails on the back thing, I'm glad you're so excited, but the fingernails on the back thing, you know, it just doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when you whisper in my ear that you're glad to be here in the middle of sex, I love that. So it sounds like a big piece of it is talking about it, talking about it, making yourself vulnerable, taking the risk that, right. you, that maybe somebody's feelings might be a little hurt, but if you do it gently and in a caring way, you can work through whatever it is. Yeah, I never understood, and I've been doing this work now for 40 years, I never understood this idea that if one person says to another, you know, I'd prefer that you, uh, that you touch me in this other way. I never understood the idea that people are insulted by that. I never understood the idea that people say, oh, don't be so bossy during sex. Because if, if you came to my house for dinner, and I was making dinner, and then you said to me, oh, by the way, I generally don't like very much garlic in my food. I wouldn't say, oh, how dare you tell me how to cook? I would say, thank you for telling me mm -hmm. because so, I want to you to have a good meal experience at my house. So part of sexual intelligence is depersonalizing the experience, not taking it so personally, understanding that everyone has their own unique needs and way that they want to experience sex and that it's not all about how you do it or, or what your way is. It's about uh, developing a relationship. That's exactly right. Um, when people talk about what behaviors do you want to do in sex, I think that what people really should talk about is how do you want to feel during sex mm. and figure out what do we want to do with the arms and legs? So how do you want to feel during sex? Do you want to feel graceful? Do you want to feel youthful? Do you want to feel experimental? Do you want to feel really connected? Mm. Do you want to feel um, like uh, you're being pleasured? How do you want to feel? That should dictate what we do with the arms and legs rather than getting a picture of, I want to do a certain position, and if it hurts my shoulder, well, I'm going to try and ignore that. Mm -hmm. Or we do a certain position, and you're, you know, a little bit bored by that, you know, tough luck. So I think we, uh, a lot of people have it backwards. They start with, I want to do such and such a position. That's the wrong place to start. You're right. Well, and you might get there and just find out, wow, this just doesn't even work. For, for, for That's me, true, for too. For either of us. That's true, too. There are a lot of configurations of limbs that they look good on paper, you know, but when you go to do it. Story it, of my life. <laughs> Let me tell you. Looks good on paper. Ah, doing it, not so great. 
All right. And so um, it's really important to have that communication. What if your partner's a little uncomfortable talking about sex? How would you bring it up with them in a way that makes it easy for them? Well, I would say, look, maybe you're not comfortable talking about this, but I really want to be closer to you. Or, or uh, you may not be comfortable talking about this, but I want to have good sex with you. And this is what we need to do. So, I really, yeah, I, I really want both of us to enjoy this. And if we talk, if you allow us to talk about it, the, the possibility that you, you and I might get more from it. Yeah, that's more words than I might use in the first sentence. I'm a very wordy guy. What can I tell you? But, but, but that's the principle. My wife won't talk to me because I'm so wordy. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right. That's the principle that, um, look, the communication is going to lead to this really great outcome. So come on. I understand that you have a recently published book on this topic of sexual intelligence. Well, you're a little behind the times. It's not that recent. However, however, it's a wonderful book. I'm my, not that young, so it might be feel recent for me. <laughs> right. My, actually, my latest book is about pornography, but we're not going to talk about that today. My, my, um, the book that you're talking about is Sexual Intelligence. He says, holding it up to the camera. I see published by Harper Collins a few years ago. Congratulations. Uh, sexual intelligence, uh, what we really want from sex and how to get it. It's my most popular book so far. And uh, in the book, I talk about, uh, there's a lot of uh, stories, case studies, you know, and different ways that people can use the ideas around sexual intelligence to create more relaxed, more enjoyable eroticism and intimacy. Nice. And uh, I understand that, you have an offer for our listeners. Oh, yes, of course. And, and hurry up and do it right now and you'll get two, right? Um, actually, if you go to my website, sexed.org, not sexed.com, which is a porn site, sexed.org. Thanks for that distinction. I mean, they might want to go to sexed.com, but they won't get the book there. That's right. That's a, a, you, free to go there, free to go there. If you go to my website, sexed.org, you can find this book and all my other books. And if you use a discount code, NL10, you get a 10% discount. How awesome. great. And I understand that's for, for e ebook or a printed book. That's right. Right. That's for the digital uh, version or the print version. Digital version is much less expensive, no postage, nothing. God, you know what I realized? I totally forgot to ask you the first question I ask everybody who's on this show. Can I ask it now? Good. Yes. So the first question I usually ask but I think it's very applicable because I'm very interested in how you got into this work. How did your heart lead you into this work, this particular work? Well, the way I started in, in the sex field is through uh, Planned Parenthood. I started as a pregnancy counselor. And uh, from there, I uh, was asked to do more and more stuff. Uh, and so I got more and more training. And one day I woke up and uh, I was a sex therapist. Um, I actually started in the sex field because I wanted to reduce unwanted pregnancy, which I felt would be a way to address um, domestic violence and poverty, mm. reduce unwanted pregnancy. But um, when I was hanging around in the sex field at the beginning, uh, eventually I realized, hey, there's other things involved in the sex thing other than reducing unwanted pregnancy. Mm. And why weren't people using contraceptives uh, uh, properly? Because they weren't willing to talk about sex and they weren't willing to touch their own genitalia. So that got me thinking, uh, there's a step before contraceptive use, and that is people being comfortable with their sexuality. So I decided what I'm going to be about is helping people get more comfortable with their sexuality. And so that's been my work for 40 years. I love that. And I, I love that this whole conversation, even though we didn't start off at that point, this whole conversation has reflected that passion. That's super cool. Yep. That's what I do. And the way to help people get more comfortable with sexuality is to just make it relaxed and normal. Too many people think that what sexuality is about is amping up the intensity and amping up the excitement. And I think it's exactly the opposite. I think what leads to enjoyable sex and intimate sex is to just get more and more relaxed. So I think of a sexual encounter not as climbing a mountain, but as descending a valley. If you think about taking a, a mule down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you know, and just getting more relaxed, more relaxed, more relaxed, 
and more accepting of whatever happens during this encounter, that's where tremendous pleasure and intimacy can come from. Yeah, there's a, I've been watching Emily in Paris with my wife and there's a scene where uh, Emily's in bed with a guy and he's really gone at it. And she puts her fingers on his lips and she says, slow down, you're supposed to savor this. And it's kind of a joke because earlier he had said the same thing to her about mm -hmm. sipping champagne. And you know, he slows down and the whole dynamic changes. So yeah, but actually so great that, number one, so great that um, they were showing this dialogue. And number two, for Emily, the character that she felt free to say, hey, you know, <laughs> it, I mean, it, it's okay. It makes it okay to talk even in, you don't have to talk just before, you don't have to talk after, you can talk during and still have it work and still have it be better. Correct. What is the legacy you'd like to leave behind? Well, since I don't play the electric guitar, that lets that out. Um, actually, um, it's my writing mostly. Uh, I've written about um, I've written about a thousand articles about sex and uh, published seven books. And um, I, I guess I want my legacy to be challenging conventional ideas about sexuality um, without being so exotic that the average person can't get value from it. So um, I don't talk about 57 sexual orientations and um, I don't think we need more exotic sex toys or more exotic positions. What I want my legacy to be, Rich, is, um, is helping people realize that no matter what their bodies look like, no matter what uh, age there are, they are, that if they want to have sexual intimacy, that they can do that without having to do something so outside their comfort zone that it's unrealistic. Um, I want my legacy to be that people will think, ah, if we just slow down and savor it, it doesn't matter what the arms and legs do. We can just connect and enjoy a sexual experience. Sweet. Sweet. Um, I love that. I love that. Well, listen, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show. And to our listeners, of course, all the information of Dr. Klein's website and the discount code and all that good thing good all those good things are going to be in the notes for the podcast and for the video blog which accompanies it marty thank you so much i'm actually really honored to have such an accomplished author and and therapist on my show i really 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 appreciate your time thank you rich it's a pleasure